Sometime in 2021, Bernard Arnault and his family eclipsed Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk in terms of wealthiest people in the world. While mm. Musk has recently taken over the top spot, Bernard Arnault remains one of the world's wealthiest men as a result of his ownership of LVMH. Forbes dubbed him one of the world's 100 greatest living minds, which seems like an understatement given that he controls a portfolio of over 70 companies and approximately 3,900 retail outlets. Arnold, the CEO of LVMH, works long days and nights, and the sheer quantity of high-end companies overseen by the Louis Vuitton umbrella is difficult to comprehend. So, how has one man managed to maintain this control over several luxury companies? This is the story of how a French engineer went on a buying spree to become the owner of the largest business conglomerate in the world. This is the story of Bernard Arnault and the LVMH brand. Bernard Arnault's Early Years Arnault was born on March 5, 1949, in Roubaix, France. His initial passion was music, but he lacked the skills to become a concert pianist. So, after graduating from a prominent engineering school, he went to work for his father's family civil engineering firm, Ferret Savinal. Arnold began his career as a construction worker, but even at such a young age, he was already filled with big business ideas. He finally persuaded his father to sell the engineering firm and focus instead on property investment and hospitality. His father was quite impressed by the insight of his son. They renamed the firm Farinelle and Arnold was appointed CEO the next year. While Arnold handled the company well, his interests extended beyond real estate. He was drawn to expensive labels, particularly Dior. It was an obsession that began with his mother, who had always been a fan of Dior scents. The name Dior is the first one that will come to mind when talking about the list of companies under the control of Bernard Arnault and the reason is simple, it was the first company he purchased. How did Arnault purchase luxury brand Dior? According to legend, Arnault once visited the United States and stepped into a cab. His driver indicated his interest in French culture and politics after hearing Arnault's accent. Arnault then inquired of the driver about the name of the French president. Arnault is said to have been shocked by the response he got. I do not know who your president is, but I do know the name Christian Dior, remarked the driver. That driver's answer dramatically altered Arnault's life. He was intrigued by Dior and the company's global brand awareness. Dior was a secret asset within the struggling textile and retail giant Boussac at the time. Boussac had filed for bankruptcy, and the French government was going to choose someone to lead the empire. Arnault was still a young real estate entrepreneur when he learned that the French government was seeking a buyer. While the struggling textile factory was in bad shape, it did control a lot of key firms, including Dior. Of course, Arnault was eager to acquire Dior's parent firm. He took the risk and accepted the offer. In order to acquire the iconic French fashion brand, Arnault, then 35, combined $15 million from his family with $45 million from the French banking organization Lazard Frères. This single acquisition elevated him from just a family businessman to CEO of a luxury brand. With the purchase, Arnault cemented his position as one of France's most powerful businessmen, but the young French man was only getting started. When Arnault purchased Boussac, it possessed a number of businesses. Among the brands are Christian Dior, Bon March, and a disposable diaper division. Arnault, on the other hand, was only interested in two of them. As a result, he liquidated almost all of the company's assets, retaining only the iconic Christian Dior brand and the Bon Marque department store. These two had a strong foothold in the industry, unlike the other brands Arnault sold off. Arnault understood the power of brands with a sense of history. While being fresh and distinctive in the world of technology might serve as a branding power, in most other industries, such as fashion, history equals value. 
Young Arnold believed that perpetual survival is a type of social evidence, and longevity is a perfect source of validation. This is why the business mogul chose well-known brands that had been around for decades. He recognized their brand and leveraged his extensive experience in the luxury industry to launch what would become the world's greatest luxury conglomerate. One of his objectives was to concentrate the company's efforts completely on luxury items. Having seen that his tactics with the Busak takeover were successful, Arnott was ready for the next big step. Bernard Arnott's LVMH Takeover most people know Arnold as the CEO and chairman of LVMH, but many are unaware of how he came to hold that position. The acquisition was dubbed a corporate duel to the death by the New York Times, and it was far from peaceful. Arnold's main focus at the time was Dior's perfume section, which had been sold to a merging of fashion firm Louis Vuitton and spirit company Mote Hennessy, LVMH. It was a weakness that Arnold disliked and he wanted Dior's perfume license to be restored. However, there was a problem. LVMH was doing well and it didn't seem like Arnold would ever get into the mix. However, fate was kind to Bernard Arnold. A spat between the company's brand heads provided him with an unexpected opportunity. It all began in 1987. Alain Chevalier was the leader of Mote Hennessy at the time. Chevalier was an experienced manager who operated a profitable firm. While his company was successful, it was also vulnerable to a hostile takeover. For several months, Alain Chevalier had observed an anomaly in the stock price of his firm. Someone was purchasing a large number of shares, causing the stock to surge unexpectedly. Chevalier suspected that the quiet accumulation was the result of a takeover offer and he began yearning for a secure shareholder base. On the other hand, Louis Vuitton was led by 76-year-old Henry Rackemeyer. In 1943, Rackemeyer had wedded Odile Vuitton, a great-granddaughter of the founder and a major shareholder of Louis Vuitton. As time went on, Rackemeyer took over the reins of power at the fashion company. So, when Louis Vuitton and Mote Hennessy joined to form LVMH, it felt that only good could come from it. Rackemeyer was meant to benefit diversification from the merger, while Chevalier would be protected against hostile takeovers. Everything seemed perfect, but trouble soon started. The two leaders soon disagreed, and the business love affair soured within weeks. Despite the merger, Rackemeyer ran Louis Vuitton as if he were the sole owner. He had his name put above Chevalier's on business cards. He also publicly protested to the media, and even went so far as to disparage the Spirits Manufacturing Company, claiming that, champagne can be found on the shelves of every corner supermarket, but our leather goods require exclusive distribution. To make matters worse, Rackemeyer felt intimidated when Chevalier proposed hiring Chanel's previous CEO as the company's future CEO. Rackemeyer again took to the media, stating, Mote Hennessy wasn't living up to our agreement. They saw the merger as an absorption. We saw it as a marriage of equals. For us, maintaining autonomy was very important. Despite their apparent hostility, Chevalier had other things to worry about. His company's stock price was growing once more, indicating that someone was still purchasing a substantial percentage. He began working with Lazard Frères, the same financial organization that assisted Arnold in acquiring the failing textile factory Boussac a few years before. Chevalier requested Lazard to create convertible bonds that were meant to be sold to international investors, but Lazard instead distributed the bonds to a limited number of domestic institutions. Chevalier realized he needed to act swiftly once more. He needed very strong financial backing. Unlike Henry Rackemeyer, who had the backing of the Louis Vuitton family, Chevalier was just a paid manager, so he sought after his friend, Sir Anthony Tennant of Guinness. Guinness and LVMH already distributed wines and spirits together, and Chevalier offered a low-risk investment, since he had previously mentioned a 3.5% ownership. Rackemeyer first agreed, 
but Chevalier soon realized that such a tiny sum would not give significant security against a hostile takeover. He increased the stake to 20%. Rackemeyer didn't quite agree to this and he saw it as a declaration of war. Speaking to the media, he stated, this was a demonstration that wine and spirits wanted to take the leading role over baggage and accessories. As a result, he decided to get an ally of his own. He got on the phone with Bernard Arnault. Rackemeyer admired Arnault. In fact, he saw Arnault as the younger version of himself, not necessarily a rival. He proposed that Arnault make an offer for 25% of LVMH's stock. This, together with the assets of the Louis Vuitton family, would give them a voting majority. The two individuals had the same vision, and the idea was for Rackemeyer to be the leader and Arnold to be his successor. The stage was set for a thrilling business battle. Rackemeyer and Arnold versus Chevalier and Tennant. Rackemeyer contacted Chevalier while he was on holiday in the French Alps to alert him about the imminent proposal. Chevalier requested a few days to contemplate, which Rackemeyer approved. When Arnold learned of the news, he became enraged and phoned Antoine Bernheim, a senior partner at Lazard Ferrets. It was Antoine's response that would then change the trajectory of things. Antoine Bernheim told Bernard Arnault to be wary of Rackemeyer, who just wants to use Arnault against his rival, Chevalier. Instead, Bernheim organized a meeting between Arnault and Chevalier, promising a larger stake in LVMH. Chevalier convinced Arnault to join their cause, and Arnault swapped sides quickly and surreptitiously. As you can expect, this enraged Rackemeyer much, but by the time he realized the gravity of the situation, it was too late. Arnault had purchased 16% of LVMH stock on the open market and another 8% through convertible bonds owned by his bankers. But Arnault wasn't finished. In only three days, he amassed another $600 million in shares, bringing his total holdings to 37.5%. As a result, he became the largest stakeholder of the four. He even ended with enough votes to make his father chairman of the supervisory board. Although the battle between Rackemeyer and Arnold continued for a while, with the French media dubbing it, the young wolf versus the old lion, everyone other than Arnold soon retired and he was unanimously voted chairman of the organization. Arnold felt on top of the world after taking over LVMH, and his success inspired him to embark on one of the greatest buying sprees in corporate history. He has spent billions of dollars acquiring prominent European enterprises over the last four decades. His attention tended to be drawn to fashion, perfume, expensive timepieces, and exquisite wines and spirits. What stands out about his takeovers is that he only wants the finest of the best. Under the ownership and control of Bernard Arnault, LVMH has executed the takeover of Gavinci, Kenzo, Celine, Marc Jacobs, Sephora, Tag Heuer, The Gucci Group, Fendi, Hermes, Bulgari, Tiffany & Co., the French economic newspaper, which he subsequently sold, and the foundation Louis Vuitton, Off-White, Phoebe Philo, Fenty, Rapassi, Bulgari, Moynat, amongst many others. Since acquiring Dior, the French tycoon has bought no less than 70 luxury companies through his now famous holding firm, LVMH Louis Vuitton Mode Hennessy. He has collaborated and collaborated with many famous people, including British fashion designer John Galliano, Alexander McQueen, Marc Jacobs, and many more. This is the story of how a construction worker fought his way to become the luxury brand kingpin that he is today.